So as we talked about in the last video, we kind of started describing volumetric and area loads, and we focused mainly on dead loads, but we also talked a little bit about live loads. Okay, in this lesson, we're going to dive more deeply into some live load um, considerations and start to talk about some different types of live loads, such as the ash tow requirements and then the truck and the lane load type of loads that you'll you'll be encountering as we start to kind of look at that. So, without further ado, we'll get ourselves going. So as we talked about last time, most of these loads that we're going to be covering in this in this series all come out of that ASCE 710, that minimum design loads uh, document for buildings and other structures. Okay, and so the way these typically are set up is it's basically chapter by chapter. Chapter three would be dead loads. Chapter four in this book is live loads, and they're generally set up that the first designation that you see is some sort of definition that kind of describes some of the terminology as they are trying to present the information. So I always start when I'm looking at my load definitions, kind of going through this, this glossary of definitions that you see here. Okay, and in particular you can see their formal definition of a live load is a load produced by the use and occupancy of the building or other structure that does not include construction or environmental loads. Okay, now construction is kind of its own different animal, all right, because construction loads can be excessive and while you need to account for them, you know, on the everyday, you know, once the building is completed, you'll never have, you know, a bulldozer or, you know, a steamroller running around on top of your structure after it's constructed. So it's kind of a, you know, a short-term special consideration that you want to check the structure to make sure it's okay. But if I can get through construction or design the construction sequencing in such a way, a lot of times I want to be able to design for the day-to-day -day use, that 40 pounds a square foot for a residential or 50 pounds per square foot for for an office and those kind of things. Okay, now live loads are broken into two categories specifically, and that's and this is the way that they're handled. Okay, the first one is what we call, you know, is it's just the basic live load that I read to you. Okay, and it does not include environmental loads such as wind, snow, rain, earthquake, flood, or dead loads. Those are not included in the live load definition. But they also split out the roof live load as something a little bit different, okay? Okay, and what this is, this is a supplemental load because in most structures on a day-to-day -day basis, the average user isn't going to have access to the roof. Okay, it's generally it's you know, behind a locked door. Um, now, there are exceptions to this, obviously, if you have rooftop dining or something like that. But, you know, in most office buildings or schools or stuff, or even your house, getting on the roof is, is a bit of a challenge. All right, and so you don't expect a whole lot of loads to be gathered at that location. Okay, and so the roof live load gets separated out, and it's just defined as being during maintenance by workers, equipment, and materials. Okay, and also accounts for loads during the life of the structure by movable objects such as planters or other similar um, small decorative appearances that are um, appurtenances that are not occupancy related. Um, I would include in this category things like broken tree limbs, you know, big tree limbs that break off and land on the roof of your building. You've got to account for the loads, and so that load will try to account for for this. But you'll notice that the definition is is you no, know, it's either you know during maintenance, okay, or by um, by movable objects um, that are not occupancy related. So the keywords are not occupancy related. Okay, and then we get into some other, other systems as well. Okay, so just, so, so just be mindful of kind of our definitions for that. So that's the, the start of our, our live load definitions. Okay, all right, now the table that I have shown here, I mentioned this in the last video. Okay, this is more of our uh, or live loads. This is that table 1607.1, and you can see that there are a couple of different cases that occur with live loads. Now, I threw out some numbers earlier on in this video, and even in the last video, talking about well, you know, residential was 40 pounds per square foot, or office was 50 pounds per square foot. Okay, and so you know, if you look, I'll let's go pull up in this case the the, the office category. There's a whole lot of categories, and all of these are live loads, and you'll notice that there are two. Get this down here a little bit. 
two categories that have to be considered. The first one is the uniform or the PSF. So this is that area load that we talked about in the last video. If you don't remember what that is, go back and take a look at it and explain it in more detail, okay? But there's also the case of having to be able to account for a single concentrated load at any point in the structure in, in the amount of a certain value, okay? And so, you know, for the case of our office building, you can see, and like I say, the more common ones you tend to know or, or to, to, to memorize, you know, things like, you know, the office building, this office line down here is just your general, you know, nothing special um, office load. There's the 50 that it came from. But there's also a requirement that I have to be able to put a 2,000 pound uh, point load anywhere that this 50 pounds per square foot load is, is possible, and it can be anywhere. And generally that means I have to put it in the worst possible place from a structural engineering standpoint. Okay, so you see that a lot of these loads are either 2,000 pounds. Um, you get into hospitals, there's only 1,000 pounds, but some of those loads are uh, you know, 80 pounds per square foot for hallways, 60 for operating rooms. You, know, you can see that the values climb based on their use and those kind of things. Um, let's see, what else? If we look, we can go over to uh, uh, residential, uh, one and two family dwellings, uh, uninhabitable attics are designed for 10 pounds per square foot. Again, the idea being that people won't be up there. This is kind of like that roof load. Um, uh, attics with storage are generally set at 20 pounds per square foot. Now, if you're going to stack, you know, you know, 100 years worth of library books in your attic, that number probably isn't sufficient. Again, all these numbers you have to be using for um, you know, using your best engineering judgment. Okay, uh, private rooms and corridors and hotels and multi-story dwellings are all taken as 40. Uh, all other areas, there's the 40 that I was talking about. Okay, so you can see that it all comes out of the 1607 code and the, and the live load designations associated with them. Uh, you'll notice that in these residential sections, there is no concentrated load requirement, okay, because the, the odds of us having 2,000 pounds of something sitting, you know, you know, in our house is not very likely. So the, the background for all of this is they're designing things based off of probabilities, statistics, likelihoods, you know, and things like that. And that's how these numbers are generated. Okay. And so in a residential section with two to four people, it's not likely to have that. Okay. Now, some of the bigger, bigger categories of buildings. And again, you have this page in the handouts um, available on those. Um, if you're if you're not enrolled in the class and you're, you're just watching the video, then you can pause the video and you kind of kind of look at it and see some of the other values um, accordingly. But you can see that um, things like you know uh, special areas that I would I would be concerned with are things like libraries, okay? Because you know you have lots of books, okay? And books are considered even though uh, <laughs> they may or may not be checked out on a regular basis, you know, or if we're not talking about you know some sort of repository or something, what they call a stack room, you can see some of these loads get really, really big. You know that it could be 150, and it could be even higher. You know, um, depending on the size of the room. You know, we've got you know some some old photos of libraries in Cincinnati that are you know three stories tall and stacked high. I don't think 150 would be enough. So you got to kind of you know there's some some notes on those particular cases as well that you would want to kind of look into. But, you know, it could be 150. Um, if you get into things like warehouses or, or um, you know, service buildings or those kind of things, uh, the numbers can go up quite, uh, quite substantially as well. Things like, you know, assembly areas, which would be, you know, common meeting rooms. Um, for, for our campus, KC100 is probably designed for something more like, you know, 100 pounds per square foot. Um, if you've got movable seats or movable walls, maybe it goes to 150. Um, you could have warehouses and mezzanine areas, you know. Warehouses are kind of a tricky animal because you got to worry about movable equipment like, you know, things like forklifts and stuff buzzing around that can give you a, a, a fairly substantial point load as a result on those. So a lot of these are, um, you know, those, that particular category, the category of the forklift falls under this manufacturing category, um, which is down here, this guy. And so is it a heavy manufacturing or light manufacturing? They don't tell you how to define it, but it gives you kind of a sense that, you know, heavy manufacturing can be anywhere, you know, 250 or higher. And again, these are all super scripted, meaning, hey, use your engineering judgment. And in this case, now we've got 3,000 pounds, okay? And again, that's part of that idea that this point load can be anywhere in the structure, okay? And this is why a lot of, like, uh, heavy manufacturing are single-story buildings, and they're all built on slab on grade, okay? is because if it's a slab on grade, it means that there's no structure underneath it, you know, I'm not having to support the load in the air or hold it up. That, and then I don't get penalized as heavily for these kind of things. Okay, it's only for the elevated items that I would have to worry about. So that's why a lot of heavier loaded buildings are generally very short and very flat 
to be able to accommodate that. So that's one of the things that you'll see in this in the 1607 table from IBC. Okay, so again, this is the IBC 2015 table, and there's multiple pages of it, but that kind of gives you a sense of the different things. So you've got a uniform load and a concentrated effect that you have to take into account on this. Um, the other, the next page of this, again, I'll leave this as an exercise for you. You can see other, you know, other other design values. Uh, retail stores on the first floor are 100 pounds per square foot for higher floors are generally 75. And so forth. We got elevated walkways, storage. Um, storage is kind of a special case. We talked about the li libraries and, and mezzanine areas. That would come out of this case 31, accordingly as well. Okay. Um, they even get into some really interesting ones. Just as a side note, not that I've ever designed this, but you could actually design for a helipad. Okay, <laughs> and they give you give you guidelines on how to do that. <coughs> hmm. Okay. All right. Okay. The other category of live loads that we'll want to kind of look at. Okay, we talked about was um, were the ash tow requirements. Okay, and these are transportation live loads, and they're treated a little bit differently, but there are some similarities to what you just saw in the IBC. Okay, the ash tow requires two considerations. Okay, so imagine you're designing a bridge. Okay, and so there there are two design cases that you have to consider. The first one is known as the design truck load, and the other one is known as a design lane load. Okay, and so you imagine that you've got, you know, you're designing this truck, it's the, it's the tractor trailers that put the load on the bridges, not your car, my car, you know, a little, you know, you know, you know four-door sedan kind of thing, does not put the loads that these big, these big tractor trailers put on there. Okay, so, so Ashto is trying to come up with a method for you to be able to, to estimate these, but they leave it a little bit open to interpretation, okay? So they do, they've established what they call the HL93 design truck load case, okay? And that particular load case is based off of this picture here. This is a, an excerpt out of the Ashto 8th edition LRFD bridge design spec on here, okay? And so you've got your tractor trailer. Again, um, it's basically, it's assumed to be a three axle uh, tractor trailer. The front axle is 8,000 pounds. The, the middle axle is 32,000 pounds and the rear axle is 32,000 pounds. And this will be your design load. But what changes in this is that this is a, a set of point loads that move as a group or as a unit back and forth down the road. Well, probably forward down the road, but if you have traffic coming the other way, then you get both directions. Um, but um, the first two loads between the tractor and the first act, and that, that middle axle is set at 14 feet. Okay, but it's there's some variation that it can occur from here to here. Okay. Because, you know, depending on the type of structure, how it's framed, multi-span, single span, you know, I could get a worse case maybe if these two loads are point, point loads and all three are on one span. Or I could get into a bad case for negative moment if I have two of them on one, one span and then the trailer is on the other span. Okay, and so they put some variation to help make the worst of the problems that... Um, to, to the design case, you have to be able to account for every case of this truckload such that these two axles here are between 14 and 30 feet apart. Okay, it could be any value in between that makes your problem the worst. Okay, and so that becomes a challenge is, well, how do I know where to put these loads in such a way to give me the worst effect that I'm looking for? And this will lead us into a topic of conversation here in a couple of weeks called influence lines that will help me locate where to put things to get the worst effect that I'm after. And we'll show you some strategies for how to be able to do that. Because you don't want to have to run an analysis and basically move this truck at one foot increments along the bridge and run 100 different analyses because the bridge was 100 feet long. You could, but the time involved with setting that up is very... Uh, um, it's just not practical, and so we want to look at coming up with quick ways to get in and get the information that I want in, in, in a unique way. So that's our design truck. Uh, the other requirement is, is that this axle load is shared between sets of tires that are considered to be six feet apart. Okay, so this 32,000 pounds puts 16,000 pounds here, and it puts 16,000 pounds here, and they're six feet apart. And then you have to play the game, well, where in the lane are they? Are they on the left side of the lane or the right side of the lane? Where? So you get this back and forth, and so, again, we're playing kind of a combinatorics game as we try to try to position all of these. So there is some variation. So that's the first requirement. That's the that's the design truck uh, lane. Okay. They also to account for the case where you have a lot of you know littler cars parked all in one spot instead of these big tractor trailers that put huge point loads at distinct locations, you know, other other loads to account for the other case is what we call the design lane load case. Okay, and what this is, is it requires a minimum load applied in any combination of 10-foot lanes. So your lane is considered to be 10-foot wide, right? And so for that 10-foot width, you have to put a certain amount of load down the length of, of the board, or, or down, the, down the length of the road, what they call the longitudinal direction, okay? 
And so, um, and so the specification for that design lane load comes out of this 3.6.1.2.4 that says that you're going to the design lane load just consists of a load of 640 KLF that's kips per linear foot. So this is a line load, okay, that's uniformly distributed in the longitudinal direction. Okay, so you're going to have have that have that lane load down the entire length in that magnitude. Okay, and all, and so that that covers you know the case of you know does your is your car is it is it veering back and forth is it you know or maybe it gives it helps pro provide some protection against the variability of those okay okay and and then so um, the 640 KLF is distributed in the longitudinal direction and then transversely the design lane load shall be assumed to be uniformly distributed over a 10 foot width. Okay, and so the force effect from the design lane load shall not be subject to dynamic load allowance. Okay, so where this would have a, could have a dynamic increase, which we'll talk a little bit about, not a lot, um, impact and dynamic increases, this guy is not. So you always have to kind of go back to the specifications and see the wording and the way that things are described there. All right, so that's our, our kind of our transportation live loads. All right, so now, so that kind of gets us to our next topic. We've spent some time talking about dead loads and live loads. Well, how do you put them together? Okay, because obviously you could have dead load and live load occurring simultaneously, right? You know, the weight of the building is a dead load and your occupancy, your people are your live load. Okay, and so ASCE 710 will set up, has come up with some base combinations for you to consider. Okay, now there are others in IDC, but the, historically for a preliminary analysis, it comes down to these seven cases here. Okay, now the letters that you see, again, we're going to define all of this by the letters that are here. D is dead load, E is earthquake, L is live load, LR is that roof live load, R is rain, S is snow, W is wind, um, and then there's some others as well. Okay, but the combinations basically say that in order to provide some semblance of protection, because all the loads that we've calculated have been the true and actual values, nowhere up to this point have we talked about safety factors. Okay, and so one of the ways that we ensure safety in a structure is, is, is we increase the loads when we analyze it. Okay, so say you have a 100-pound object on your structure. Well, if it's a dead load, maybe I'm designing it for 100, you know, my structure to hold 140 pounds. It gives me some room for error because, again, even dead loads are never exactly the number that you're estimating them to. So there has to be some safety. But these coefficients that come in here, again, come out of probability and statistics that the idea being that, okay, a dead load, I'm fairly confident on its magnitude and its location within a certain degree. So um, typically you'll see that I increase, you know, you know, 20% in this case and 40% in this case, which that's not an insignificant increase. But compare that, say, for this case too, 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live. So the dead load gets a 20% increase. The live load gets a 60% increase. So it's a much larger increase on these. Okay, and so these combinations all are increased as a result of these coefficients that are have you know statistics in their background. Okay, so the first case is 1.4 dead. That's just kind of a, a general dead load. A lot of times this captures a lot of your construction type of type of setup. Um, this number two is probably the most common of all of them, but you can see that it's 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live. Plus, now this is where you got to kind of watch the the, the extra words. 0.5 times either the roof live load or the snow load or the rain load okay and their idea being that these three seldom occur at exactly the same time so when you're designing your load case you'll run your structure you'll do your structural modeling and you'll run the analysis and then i'll put you know a 1.2 dead 1.6.5 lr and then 1.2 dead 1.6 live 0.5 snow 1.2 dead 1.6 live 0.5 rain will be the factor. So this number two case actually has three cases built into it. If you go down to the third case, you can see that I have 1.2 dead plus a 1.6 of these guys plus one of these guys. So if you look at that, that means I could have the LR with 1.6 and L of 1.0, or I could have an LR of 1.6 and a 0.5 W, or I could have a 1.6 snow and L or 1.6 snow and 0.5 W. And you see that again, it's a combinatoric. So this number three case actually gets you six cases out of it. And it just, it builds up from there. So you gotta kinda watch these or cases. Now one of the exercises that you guys will do in this class is I'll have you guys make a spreadsheet that will help you tally these things up because you're constantly trying to figure out in a hurry which one's the worst that I need to be considering for a certain application. And so rather than run these numbers by hand every single time, a spreadsheet tool is very, very handy and I'll have you guys do that. Okay, now. 
So those are the, so you can see, so all of them are pretty much the same. We get some earthquake stuff. There's an E here. Uh, wind is kind of a tricky one because wind doesn't always come from the same direction. So in addition to all of these, anywhere that you see a wind, well, I could have a wind out of the north, out of the south, out of the east, out of the west. I could have a quartering wind. You could have as many as eight different wind cases that show up anywhere that there's a W. So if you go back up to case number three that had six cases, for every six cases that you had in here with a, you know, with a for every case that had a W in it, you would get eight of those cases that reflect, reflect the wind coming from a different direction. Okay, and so you can see that it's not uncommon to get, you know, hundreds upon hundreds of load combinations you know, in a, in, a, in a fully complete structural analysis type of problem. Okay, one other interesting one that I'll show you is this number six. Okay, and this is a 0 0.9 dead. Okay, and if I look at this, and I have some sort of wind load or something, let's just say that it's a lateral load like this, that this is my wind and my dead is happening here. Okay, and what this case does, if you notice, it's kind of odd that we talked about safety, but all of a sudden I'm reducing the dead load by 10%. And what this does, this exacerbates the lateral load effects. Okay, so I've got a wind case, which is a lateral effect, or a seismic case, which is typically a lateral effect. And what that does is by, by decreasing D on this, I increase the forces that show up in the columns on the compression side. Okay, or increase the forces that will show up in the column on the tension side. It's an uplift case. And so this is an attempt to capture, you know, a column in compression behaves completely different than a member in tension. So if this guy flips because I've increased the wind loads to a certain degree, then I need to be able to design for both cases. And this case will help you capture that. Okay, so, so, so that's kind of an interesting one. And then the earthquake's kind of the same, the same basic effect. Okay, all right. All right, so those are our load combinations. Um, we won't go through a whole lot of this. This is, again, more of the, the live load chapter that came out of um, ASE 7. Okay, um, they get into some special, some special considerations, things like handrails. Um, if you get into, um, um, we do have impact loads that will show up and kind of elevators, machinery, okay, and some requirements for, you know, is it a power-driven unit, is it not, you know. Um, and then we get into something called uh, live load reduction that we'll start to cover um, in a, in, a, in a later video. All right. Okay. Um, see, that gets into those. We'll come back to live loads. Uh, crane loads, we kind of mentioned briefly about the moving, uh, what they call the maximum wheel load. All of this is outlined in this. There's a lot of light reading. Okay. All right. So, in addition to the ASCE 7 codes, I went ahead and I, I pulled up then the combinations for what you saw with the ASCE 7. I pulled up the IBC requirements, and these you can find in 1605.2. Okay, and you can see that a lot of the cases, again, there are seven cases in here. Okay, and, it, and it's 1.4 dead plus an F. Okay, uh, 1.2 dead, 1.6 LR, uh, you know, 1.0 L. So these are the same as those original seven on here. Okay, and but then they also have some factors based off of public assembly live loads in excess of 100 pounds. You can get a different factor. Okay, there are coefficients that they put into these, but behind the scenes, these are basically the same as what you're seeing in the AAC7, but with some extra stipulations. So if IBC is what's governing your design, you may end up back over here, but they're very similar. So for preliminary analysis, I don't generally worry about these two cases. I do, I run the ASC 7 cases, and then we come back around as we start to kind of solidify occupancy ratings and, and those kind of things. Okay, in addition to those seven combinations, there are two more that are very, very important. Okay, and these are what we call the deflection combinations. Okay, because recognize that all these values that we were seeing here, these coefficients were safety factors. 1.2 for dead, 1.6 for live, you know, 0 0.5, the other factors that are in there, okay. Those are increased loads. Okay, if you're doing a serviceability check, which is a study of deflections or vibrations, it doesn't make sense to run those calculations for an increased artificial load value. All right. So what we do is we do what we call service load checks. And you probably would have learned about this in your mechanics materials classes on these. And so we're going to run the case for a couple of different, uh, uh, def for the deflection cases. In addition to those seven, I also run this guy. It's uh, 1.0 times the live load plus 1.0 times the roof. That will get me a true live load deflection for a particular structure. And then, so this is the live load deflection. And then this would be, you know, our delta TL, this is our delta LL, and the total load deflection. 
which is 1.0 dead load plus 1.0 live load plus 1.0 roof. So here's your live load deflection, here's your dead load, that's your total load definition as you saw back in your, your strength and materials, your mechanics materials class. And then the live load, this is what often the deflection limits are set against. And we'll talk more about this when we get to deflection calculations later on, okay? But these are considered the service load combinations. So anytime I'm looking at a deflection limit, I'm only looking at these two guys, okay, in the cases that are produced by them. So again, we'll show you how to input these into you know, your structural analysis software and how do we set those up to be able to capture all these. And then it just becomes another combination and a whole slew of combinations. But the deflection criteria combinations are kind of a special animal. Okay, all right. So that kind of ends our talk with, um, with regards to live load. For the class, the way this class is set up is we typically have some sort of class example or something to work off of. On this, and so I've got a couple of exercises that you guys will be working on, and um, you know, in this particular case, what I've done—if I can pull this out just a little bit—oop, too far, a little bit. Yeah, it's a little bit better. Okay, and again, you guys will have the package. You'll be able to see all this information a little bit better. Is that what we have? Is we have you know a support I beam here. It's got it's holding up a concrete slab with a tributary width of six feet. There is a plaster undercoating on the bottom of the slab, and then we have a brick wall that is eight foot tall, a CMU, a 12 inch CMU wall. Okay, and so your goal is to figure out well what's the weight associated on this particular beam. Okay, so again, this is a dead load example on here and so our dead load per foot you know on this w12 by 26 okay okay and so that will be our our, our definition there so um and so all you'll do is um a lot of times what happens on these pictures if i consider this thing in kind of three dimensions it looks something kind of like that you know because the one dimension that wasn't given in this problem is what's the length of the wall right so what we do is we just basically say, well, my I-beam is here. Here's a tremendously awesome picture to be scribbling on there, right? Okay, it's basically we come in and we just take an arbitrary one foot slice, and then that gives us the dimension that we want. And then we say that for every foot of length of wall, this weight number that you had calculated becomes a weight per foot. Okay, and so it becomes a PLF load. You calculate the total weight of this assembly for a one inch or a one foot thick section into the page. And so I'll let you guys try that one as well. Um, we'll do a little bit more later on um, to get you into kind of figuring out, you know, all the loads that would go on to this. And again, trying to attribute things to certain areas. This will lead us into our tributary area calculations in, you know, in, in one of our upcoming videos. And so I'll give you guys kind of a try with this. So if you've got any questions, give me a holler. Um, you guys, and we will go from there. All right. And with that, I think we will call it a day for live loads, ash tow loads, and so forth. Anyway, have a wonderful afternoon. We'll talk to you all later. Bye-bye.